So my journey began the same way that all great journeys do, at Coach Davis's MMA gym. I needed a little bit of inspiration though for creating my newest fighter, so I went on a deep dive through the UFC 4 archives to see the previous legends that I had churned out in the name of clickbait content. Surely I'll never be able to beat these, I said to myself chuckling as I repeatedly whacked myself in the testicles with a hammer. I gave myself a penis. I set my weight to 84 kilos, the upper limit of the middleweight division. I set my height to 191 centimeters as the upper height limit of the middleweight division. I made my first name Agent, my second name 47, my nickname to the freak because of how I get down, and my social media handle to man hit because man sh would be inappropriate. I set my hometown to Miami, Florida, obviously, my age to 18 so I'd have a nice long career ahead of me murdering people in the octagon for billions of pesos, my stance to Southpaw, and then I chose to stand like Yoel Romero even though he stands nothing like this. Finally, I set my walkout music to whatever the hell this song is, and it was time to figure out what I was going to look like, which was no easy feat, especially with so many great looking character presets to choose from. Finally, however, I decided on Conor McGregor with dreadlocks. Obviously, along with my rugged mane of pubic hair, I plucked out my dreadlocks strand by strand and then cracked out the old hammer and chisel as I got ready to finesse my way to the most horrific monstrosity yet. Oh, baby. I then gave myself a couple of light blue eyes that I got from a real-life Viking after trading him both of my testicles and then commissioned a sick jail tattoo just above my arm. The only thing left to do at this point was to ink myself with a slick black suit and red tie with 47 thousand sharpie markers. And then to differentiate this suit from all the others that I made, I slapped down two geniusly placed light switches. After that, I bought some stupid looking purple tiger pants and some stupid purple gloves to complete my stupid outfit. I then gave myself a Mexican mouth guard because I'm from Florida. Viva la Mexico! And with all that crap out of the way, I tied everything up by selecting wrestler as my fighter type so I wouldn't get grapple f***ed in the early stages of my career. Bread, not okay mo and Coach Davis then made out, and my MMA career was finally about to get underway. You see, as it turned out, Coach Davis was there looking for somebody new to make out with. Then, as fate would have it, on that exact night, I was in the cage contracting countless blood-borne diseases in a fight to the death with a hobo from Neverland. Then, despite my dominant performance, the judges still scored it in favor of Mr. He P. Titus for total significant drops of blood leaked into an opponent's eye. But after getting tested for all the three-letter blood diseases, that would prevent me from fighting in the UFC, I was asked whether I wanted to go straight there and skip all the BS leading up to it. Obviously, because I'm an idiot, I said no, and got ready to grind my way up to the top from the very, very bottom, which just so happened to be Coach Davis's gym. I went to introduce myself to Coach Davis, and he looked me square in the eyes and said, you the ugliest mother... I then fisted him and told him that I'd meet him tomorrow with my clothes off for some good old-fashioned fisticuffs. When Davo unlocked the gym the following morning at 3am, he asked me how I got in, and then looked at the smashed skylight, looked at me, smiled and nodded. He then asked me whether my eyes actually functioned as eyes or whether they were just there for decoration. I told him I honestly didn't know because my skull had grown its way directly down and in front of them. Ladies love it. He told me he probably didn't believe that, but as long as I could beat the shish kebabs out of a heavy bag, it made no difference to him. Dun, 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 dun. Standing up, back on my feet. What's the time? Where's my pants? Is? Coach Davis looked at me do my thing and told me that I punched like a b- Then we then headed down to the underground fight scene where there was an eating competition for who could slam down the most glizzies in 60 seconds. You ready? Let's go eat. Having won, I then stepped into the off-brand octagon and then dumped my opponent directly onto his head. Unfortunately, it was concrete as canvas was a little bit too costly to clean on the regular. I then pinned him up against the cage and tenderized his face like a cheap steak from Walmart. And boom, boom, you dead, son. Later at the gym, Coach Davis came in and told me that he had a truck full of peanuts for me as payment for my hard work in the octagon that night. He tricked me, though, that cheeky man, like he always does, with peanuts. I love peanuts. 
nuts. And then he took me down to the underground urine bridge again for another fight. There were so many used uncapped syringes on the floor that I kind of wished I had of worn shoes. But I guess it kept me on my toes. Sadly, however, the same couldn't be said for my opponent, Vega from Street Fighter, who crumpled like a lawn chair underneath my Floridian power. Now, having dominated the illegal fight scene thus far, old mate Davo hit me up on my Nokia 3210 to tell me that Dana White was in town and that if I whooped some serious ass, I'd get an invite to the Contender series. In the distance, I could see Dana talking to a member of probably the FBI and another member of probably the Italian Mafia. And I knew that I was about to enter the, like, middle of the line. Not quite big, like middle leagues. Right in the middle. The fight started and I got taken down and put on my back early on. But that was okay, because I had a lot of experience <laughs> laying down on my back. And then I immediately roly polied my way into top missionary position, where I pounded his ground so good that he committed not living anymore. Absolutely stoked with my win and red carpet invite to the Contender series, I headed straight to the gym to hump some dude's arm for a good five minutes. And then went back to the homeless bridge one more time to settle things with Captain Prime. Now, with my Contender Series debut the following morning, I knew I had to head down to Rodeo Drive to get a little bit of plastic surgery on my rotten watermelon of a head. Because honestly, between you and me, I couldn't imagine playing through the entire career with this stupid caveman face. Which says a lot, because stupid caveman faces are kind of my thing. And because I kind of fancy myself pretty alright at UFC games, not only was I playing on the hardest difficulty possible, but I also decided to skip every training camp and take every single thing fight on one week's notice because I am a giga chad. Davo slid into my DMs and told me that if I could secure a first round finish, I'd immediately graduate from the contender series and get a first class ticket straight in to the UFC. Little did coach know, however, that my intentions were to stay in the amateur leagues until I was about 40 years of age and right on the verge of late stage CTE dementia before I finally accepted Dana White's invite into the UFC, where I would eventually destroy everyone, take the middleweight strap and then completely forget who I was and what I was doing. What can I say? I've always been a record breaker and also a little bit of a face breaker too. Matter of fact, I broke so many faces in the worst ways possible whilst I was in the contender series that I got kicked out and sent straight to the Women's Fighting Association as punishment. My first opponent was Fatty Yankee Crapping. Then let me tell you, in that octagon, I was crapping all over him. It was also about double his size, which was hilarious. Finally, however, after I stopped laughing, I gave him the old starchy starch to the face and that was the end of that. Unfortunately, however, my leg was broken. That is to say it was spinal. That is to say it was like a balloon. But it was okay, because I still had two more. Then it was at that moment that Jackie Willie came along and challenged me to a biffo. So being the gentleman that I am, I engaged in a nice respectful conversation with him on social media. Then, well, that's how that went. Face meet foot, foot, Meat face. Anyway, after getting banished to the shadow realm of the WFA, it seemed like my exploits had finally regained my favor with the UFC gods, and so I was reinvited one more time to join the Contender Series for the second time. I said no. Then instead, I just continued to plow through scrubs on the amateur circuit, inflating my win record against nobodies that ever stood a chance to begin with, and giving myself tons and tons and tons of brain damage. It was awesome. Even more awesome, though, was that I continued to reject offers to fight in the UFC for six digits per fight and instead I opted for my modest $6,000 paycheck instead because I didn't do it for the money. I did it for the CTE. And because I had another bone to pick with Captain Bloody Price. Now to say that I had a troubled upbringing would be the understatement of the century. So I took the opportunity to work through my childhood trauma issues by flatlining a bunch of losers in the octagon for $6,000 a piece and on national television. It was great. Though between you and me, I think Coach Davis was getting a little bit annoyed at the fact that I continued to reject million dollar contracts in favor of Macca's wages, but I still had work to do on the WFA. That work was claiming the Women's Fighting Association belt for myself so I could pawn it on eBay and buy a fat brick of 
Yes! Before my title fight, Coach Davo came into the change rooms and gave me a little bit of a pep talk where he said things like, you're what happens when the franger breaks and your hands aren't big enough to protect that ginormous melon of yours and if I was your daddy, I would beat the shit out of you. And then we got ready to do work. Then despite old fella trying to catch me in the clinch, he stood no chance against my cinder blocks of hands. Boom, boom, suck on these bad boys, biatch. Before leaving the WFA, however, I thought it would only be appropriate that I defend my belt at least once or twice. So I did, and consequently got my fastest KO ever. I mean, look at this doofus. 25 seconds from 100% alive to 100% dead. Then, then there were these guys. I don't know why I'm including this in the video. It doesn't really have much value besides the fact that it's always fun watching a brutal KO replay, isn't it? I know I love it. <laughs> yeah, senseless violence. That's my forte. <laughs> then, then having got all of that toxic masculinity out of my system, I decided to finally, after about <laughs> 20 years of in-game time, move to the US. UFC. Now, my first match in the UFC was against none other than old mate Robbo Widow, who was now 41 years old and way past his prime, which was great for me. Now, Rob tried to close the distance, but little did he know that I'd visited Stephen Thompson the week before and I'd learned a couple more fancy spinny kicky things, which made it difficult for him to get up in my face. Then, then after kicking him flush in the head, the adrenaline got the better of me. I'm not proud of it, but you know what happens and I gave him the finger for no reason whatsoever. Honestly, he's the nicest guy ever, and even I felt a little bit bad about it. But nowhere near as bad as he felt after hitting this combination, though. I am also, admittedly, not very humble or gracious in victory. That is to say, I am a pretty terrible person. It was at that moment, however, that Uncle Dana tried to force me into a fight for the belt. But as you all know, I have my own timeline and I do things when I want to, and so I opted to fight Seaman B <laughs> Seaman Banana instead. Great job, Lance. Oh. Now, at this point in history, Kevin Gasoline had the belt, but I did not want to fight Kevin Gasoline, so I declined. And instead, I fought Kamzat Kimiev. Very scary, brother. Also very good at takedowns too, brother, apparently. But your boy, your boy dropped bombs, son. Yeah, boom, boom. Get that up, your. And fortunately, now Kevin Gasoline had lost his belt. And I got to fight someone really cool like Alex Pajeda. Alex came out looking absolutely terrifying as usual and way too big for the middleweight division. And then we headed into the middle of the octagon where Dan Mergliotta told us to touch gloves <laughs> and kiss if we were into that sort of thing. Then the fight began with me on the floor again. But fortunately, I am a wiggly worm and I wiggled my way out of missionary and got back to my feet. I then very skillfully stuffed the next takedown attempt like an absolute professionale. Then I counted the third with a cheeky knee to the penis. Feeling determined and motivated, I decided to stand in the pocket and throw down with Poetan, which was going well until it wasn't. And then, when he tried to take me down for the fourth time, I went full Ninja Turtle mode and half-shelled my way out of there and back onto my feet. Then I delivered a jumping crane kick that would make Daniel LaRusso proud. Tasting that sweet, sweet blood, I went in for the kill with the one 2 slap it up at ing dong to the side of the head. Then, then finally unleashed the dragon. What dragon, you ask? dragging these nuts all over yo and just like that i was crowned the new champion of the ufc middleweight division baby that's right mate 34 and 0 4.16 million the bank 236 322 fans approximately 50 years of age and 90 percent brain dead i don't know about you but that's what i call a success story for the history books if i ever saw one laters